computer. It's actually yeah. not that hard. Have you tried uh, doing recordings of uh, Zoom yet, Jeff? Yeah, I do. I usually use Audacity uh, just because I don't have to. It, <coughs> it records on uh, Zoom. You have to tran You have to change the file from a video to an uh, audio. So right. I have Audacity open, and I do both. Just in case oh, so you can questions. record in Audacity. That's yeah, very that's what I usually do. I have Audacity, uh, Audacity open pretty much all the time. Cool. Uh, and then when I, yeah, I just record to that. Okay. Well, hey, are, are we? What are we discussing today? What's the topic? We're, we're going to start out talking about what to do now that Bernie's out. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk about the longs, like Earl. Possibly, Hume. if we get to it. Let's see how <coughs> things go. Um, all right. Wait. I'm doing something <coughs> wrong. Okay. Share screen. Share computer sound. That's it. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm trying to give us a nice start uh, for uh, for the YouTubes. Oh, okay. Is that out. where we're going to post this? Uh, we're going to put it in both places, but this is our first kind of online like YouTube podcast. All right, so All right. Here's, here's the intro. I can get it going. <clears throat> Hi there, come up on the porch. We're just sitting here watching it rain and talking about Louisiana. I'm Bruce McGee. And I'm Steve Payne. And we're here today with Jeffrey Fairwell. Welcome, Jeffrey. How's it going? Going well. Thank you for coming back on the podcast. We're, this is an experiment for us. We're trying to um, record it both for the audio and for video. So we'll see how that goes. Um, quick, Stephen and I can pull this off so we may have more videos in the future. Yeah, we, yeah turn, that, turn that background sound. There you go. There we yeah. go. Yeah. So can you hear me? Can y'all hear me all right? Yep. Yeah, now I can. Yeah. Let me, oh crap, let's start it again. <laughs> so much for professional. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks out of that. You can always put it in in post too if you wanted to, like, uh, just like slide in uh, audio and fade it in through Audacity. I've, uh, yeah, we can, I can do Audacity. It's uh, <laughs> the video editing that's a little uh, beyond okay. me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I tried that last night and I, I haven't cracked it yet. So, mm -hmm. um, I was really distressed at the way that Bernie Sanders' campaign ended. What about you? Where are you on this? Let's do a check-in. Mm -hmm. um, I, I could start. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Disappointed, I suppose. <coughs> but, um, I actually was on a couple of calls with some folks that I would met on the campaign and some, some staff as well. Uh, and there was a lot of positives that came out of it, specifically from the sense that uh, there were a lot of contacts that were made. Um, one of the folks that I talked to was uh, Jonah, who did a lot of the union members for Bernie Sanders stuff. Uh, and there was a lot of sort of inroads and, and contact making and, and lists being sort of constructed uh, in those kinds of spaces. So I met people from, you know, the... Uh, you know, campaign workers to the... Uh, electrical workers to teachers all across the country so there's there's definitely a lot of positive um trajectory that <clears throat> of it, even if it didn't kind of end up the way that we want well it is a long game because mm -hmm. um in 2008 the last time we had a similar economic collapse um there was no real active left in the United States. It was basically mm -hmm. Ralph Nader riding around in a Volkswagen, you know? Right. Uh, and um, by 2000, nice. what's that? I said, which is nice, <coughs> I suppose, but it's not going to change. Or, or, anyway. or Chris Hedges. It was right. Chris Hedges maybe, you know, going to Zuccotti Park and, and being pissed off. <laughs> right. Well, we weren't at Zuccotti Park yet, but Chris was riding around with Ralph. You know, it was like mm -hmm. the two of them. Uh, Sancho Panza and Don Quixote and mm -hmm. everybody thought they were nuts and um, then just a few short years later 2011 um, what happened then oh yes of course Zuccotti Park then and um, Occupy Wall Street and of course um, the powers that be led by Barack Obama we got to say 
crush Zuccotti Park just magically. This is one of those Obama like moves. Yeah, yeah, Bloomberg. But he was only in New York. Yeah. And if you watch Nationwide on the same night, just as if by weird coincidence, all the cities that had Occupy movements crushed them. You know, mm -hmm. the tanks rolled in. Uh, they, you know, cleared the parks out. It was in the night. Uh, they banned press. I saw uh, Amy Goodman. There was this thing called live streaming that was mm -hmm. just getting started. And Amy Goodman snuck in the back. She walked by all the big garbage trucks. And so you actually had live coverage online of the crushing of Zuccotti Park's version of Occupy. But all across the country, same thing happened. Well, what happened a couple of weeks ago, all of the Democratic contenders dropped out except Bernie Sanders magically at the same time and endorsed. And it totally oh. shifted the flow of the election so that, um, you know, everybody rushed back into the Biden boat. And it turned out that once again, Obama was behind this. He has his moves, right? Smoke filled um, room type stuff. What's that? Smoke filled room type stuff. Yeah, totally. He loves the smoke filled room. Uh, as a former community organizer, he's great at disorganizing the community. He knows mm -hmm. what to do to apply pressure at the proper time. But instead of just a bunch of people, you know, hanging out in Zuccotti Park, this time we actually got a lot further. You mm -hmm. know, 2016, 2020. We, uh, the, the nature of the debate has changed. And as you say, organizing has changed. Um, what are you, how involved were you with the Occupy back in the day? Like, uh, like you seem kind of young. Me, yeah. myself? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So I guess I wasn't connected to it in any direct way. I was sort of like watching it from afar. I was in college at the time, mm -hmm. uh, also working. And uh, it was sort of, uh, I wasn't, particularly aware of how it had manifested in New Orleans. So, but I have met some friends who have been a part of that since. <laughs> but oh, yeah. uh, as far as, as far as the, um, as far as like the Occupy thing in 20, it was 2011, I believe, yeah. 2010. 2011. Uh, I was not a part of it. I was aware of sort of like the national story behind it. Did that, was that part of your waking up? Like uh, when did your politics, like you looked around one day and said, oh, this isn't working. Uh, really, for me, it, it, it kind of manifested in a class that I took at uh, Delgado, actually. And I took a, a sociology class, a human, uh, I'm sorry, a, um, a social inequality, basically, program that was run. And the teacher was like a Marxist from Russia. Oh, which was like cool. pretty, uh, so I got a pretty, pretty solid analysis of, of what was happening uh, from a bunch of different perspectives. Um, but she sort of like spoke, I mean, the, not... So I guess I uh, don't mean perspective. I mean perspectives in a sense. Uh, I guess more more along the lines. I, I mean to say that she applied the sort of grand, mostly functionalist, so like uh, you know, uh, conservative perspective with the more Marxian conflict perspective, and that was sort of a really uh, interesting uh, way of of organizing how sort of things went through. Uh, or how it started, or it rearranged how, or it maybe maybe didn't even rearrange it. It began for me how I how to start like looking and thinking at uh, looking at and thinking about these kinds of things. Right. I mean, yes, totally. Mm -hmm. um, I my waking was much much later. I, I voted for um, Gerald Ford the first time I voted, mm -hmm. and then uh, Ronald Reagan twice, and then the most left-wing choice at that point I, I kind of woke up you know what did it for me was i ran contra i thought mm -hmm. oh my god he's a crook and mm -hmm. back then that was still kind of a thing like everybody who's still in the republican party at this point is totally on board with their guy being a crook because the decent people have been leaving right. for who's not decades. a crook who's not a crook name one person that's in politics on the national scale that you know top tier that's not a crook you mean besides Bernie? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I suppose. I mean, I like, mean like, is there anybody? Maybe be Sheriff Brown, I suppose. <laughs> you know, there's not he was that pretty many. good. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's pretty good, but definitely not Biden. And that, I guess that's what I'm getting to. Like, um, mm -hmm. let's, you know, so Bernie's dropped out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to vote for him in the primary. 
right? Sure. Uh, I think Stevens back. Good. Um, so I'm going to vote for Bernie in the primary, but you know, what are we going to do in the general? And I'm so disgusted with the Republican Party. I mean, the the Democratic Party specifically mm -hmm. in the Republican and the um, the Biden campaign in particular. You know, the, <laughs> um, issue after issue, he's like a Donald Trump light, right? <laughs> well, let's see. Or he won't even take a position on certain things or he won't, he won't, he'll, he'll go like out of his way to not criticize the president or things. <clears throat> like that. Um, as for like what behavior should be for the 2020 election, it kind of really like doesn't matter. Um, like, I, I mean, I would guess I would, the only way, like on the personal level, especially in a state like Louisiana, I think you don't see that going for Democrats either way, but, but I guess like in the grand sense, there's no affirmative case, especially for like, like people on the left for Joe Biden, right? No, the only that's the way, problem, right? Yeah. The only way that you can signify to people on the left to, I guess, de facto vote for Joe Biden, if that's what you want to do, uh, is to sort of make the negative case for Trump. And that's not right. something that's really appealing or that will particularly you know, inspire people to turn up. So we really are in a, in a really bad situation. I mean, uh, his own people are trying to figure out who's going to replace him if he, you know, crashes and burns. Maybe we right. could bring in that that quid pro quo. I like that guy. Yeah. Out of his job. And he's mm -hmm. terrible. I mean, the reason the hospitals are in such bad shape, he's been you know, cutting them to the bone. He's, and, you know, he's mm -hmm. more comfortable with Republicans than Democrats. it has been for years. Yeah. Um, you know, and he can he's get up and... He's Medicaid in New York in his budget right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is in the <clears> process <throat> of trying to cut Medicaid as <laughs> we speak. And Joe, oh, of course... Worse, worse yet, there's a whole Bernie shaming movement going on online. I mean, I've seen it, and I, I had a big what amounted to a brouhaha with somebody the other day mm -hmm. <clears> that Jeffrey goes back to what you said, that mm -hmm. people are trying to make us feel ashamed if we don't vote. And I said, it doesn't matter worth a damn if mm -hmm. Louisiana votes, because either way, our, our vote is going to go to the idiot, to Trump. I mean, I, I, mean, I suppose right? there's like a 0.001% so, like chance, I suppose, but, but it's not going to happen with the well, that's sort of situation, right? Nobody that's what's called statistics. That's that is statistical insignificance. I mean, Correct. really, I've got a yeah. friend with a PhD in statistics from Tulane, and that doesn't matter. <clears throat> and so, what we're stuck with is a guy who's pretty. He he's a mediocre candidate. Yeah, right. let's face it. Oh, we've yeah. got to get honest about that. And get real. Absolutely. Right and, now, and, they're neck and neck, even in Louisiana. That's how badly Trump's doing. You know, oh wow, really? I'm surprised. By yeah. That. Uh, uh, which uh, may you know, I may have to hold my nose and vote for Biden. I'll have to see. I'm, I'm not there yet. And I certainly want, like last time, I was arguing <clears> with people. I was doing the the Biden shimming. Like, I'm for Biden. I, I love Biden. But, I mean, <laughs> Biden. <laughs> I know Bernie. Bernie, Bernie, shit. Um, I love Bernie, but we've got to keep Trump out of office and hold our nose and look for Hillary. I can't do that this time in good conscience. You know, mm -hmm. if you're so put out with the shenanigans of the Democratic Party that you and the horrible candidate that they pushed on us. If he loses, it won't be the fault of Bernie's people. It will be the fault of the corporate Dems who pushed mm -hmm. this guy on us, knowing full well that he's incapable. I mean, <clears throat> the values he's you know, espoused over the years are not my values, and he's losing a step. Like, do you trust this guy to find his car in a three-level garage? Um, you know, <laughs> I know like, I myself to do that. But the, the, right? The, yeah, he, I know. He is proof that the establishment is scared to death. Mm -hmm. His very candidacy, his very, you know, presumptive uh, uh, nomination is proof that they're scared to death. That's why mm -hmm. he's in the, you know, the pilot's chair, so to speak. Well, That's I personally the very don't he's... think there's, I personally don't think they're scared enough. You know, they, um... <clears throat> no, not, not yet, but they are, they're scared. Yeah. That, yeah. So they thought like they up. could, they could do the same old trick again. Um, mm -hmm. Even word, I mean, nobody. This has never been done before, exactly this way, where the corporate Dems just talked everybody into in mass same day. We're all going to drop out. Even the guy that was leading, you know, think of it's it as it, it is, and you know, um, they they would rather lose to Trump than have Bernie win. Mm -hmm. For them, Bernie is a bigger loss than Trump winning. 
Mm-hmm. At least that's the way I see it. Is that- no, it's hundred percent true. I mean, and and part of what they're doing in, with this um, this this shaming movement, I view it as, uh, is almost like a preemptively blaming, right. sort of like left for for Biden's likely loss. Um, and one of the sort of one of the sort of things that I see coming through. Uh, in that as well is, I mean, again, the priority of the Democratic Party, I've said this on on Good Morning Comrade, uh, my other show, check out goodmorningcomrade.com. Yes. Uh, I've, I've, I've said this on there several times. There's a, but the priority right now for the Democratic Party is to keep the sort of left edge of what is, uh, what is available in politics <laughs> and sort of keep that as far right as possible. Right, you right. Know, you want to maintain where they're at and have that be the right edge of politics I'm sorry, because the left have of politics and everything outside of that, they want to be outside of the mainstream and outside of any kind of serious debate. So what ends up um, happening is they're keep ratcheting further and further to the right. Yeah. And, 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 you know, <clears throat> or, or, you know, worker based, or, you know, working class movements that are, that are not necessarily based on the same kinds of, uh, uh, hierarchy and, and racism that exists within, um, you know, Republican Party or even the, the, you know, more conservative elements of the Democratic Party, uh, they're essentially making their, they're making their uh, constituency smaller. Right. And that, yep. that provides an opportunity for people they to, are to, the Washington, to do so. They are the Washington generals of mm-hmm. politics. Do you remember the Washington mm-hmm. generals? Oh yeah. oh, yeah. So they're these white guys that were played, paid, I guess, pretty well to lose to the Harlem Globetrotters. Mm-hmm. And so they will do anything to keep somebody with talent <clears throat> getting on the court so that they can go out there and then, you know, fall on their ass uh, while a uh, metal art. Uh, uh, what was it? Metal art. And fall on your finger Lemon. and dunk yeah, it yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, that's yeah, and, that's the old that's the same old business about the I mean, if you read Howard Zinn and even just just read his people's history, much less the the body of his work. Zinn says that the establishment is set up so that it allows only a certain number of African-Americans, Latinos, poor whites, women, et cetera, to rise to the top. It's a rig. It's a rig deck or a, or a casino, if you will. Mm-hmm. And when you go into the casino, who's going to win? The house is going to win. Right. Mm-hmm. The house always wins, and they let a certain number of people win to give the perception well, that it's fair, but it's never it's, fair. It's, it's, a, the, it's a rigged deck and a rigged house. It's right. the worst kind of identity, well, not, not quite the worst, the white identity politics of the Republicans are the worst, but it's a pretty bad <clears throat> identity. We need this many people on the, you know, that are women, this many black people, Jews, mm-hmm. whatever. Let's get the rainbow coalition going. We'll put that, you know, a few of those in a boardroom and keep everything the same. Uh, did we talk about the movie Babe ever? Uh, you know, I've never seen it. Ah, well, Babe is a pig who lives on a farm. No, he lives in a factory farm. Yeah. And with a little bit of good luck, he winds up with a like old timey. A uh, farmer who has sheep and a barnyard full of animals who pluck, luck, and courtesy dog on it. He manages to uh, learn how to become a sheep, sheep pig and no. uh, doesn't get killed and eaten. Mm-hmm. And the moral of the story is therefore everything's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> like I, some Charlotte's Web stuff, huh? What's that? That's like some that's... Charlotte's Web stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's Horatio, it's Horatio Alger. That's the right. Horatio Alger myth. And I couldn't figure out what bothered <clears> me. <throat> I didn't have the conception at the time. I knew I didn't like the well. I loved the movie. There was something wrong with it, and I didn't know what. Mm-hmm. And it's this idea. So your whole community that you're living in is, um, you know, doesn't have medicine. It's a food desert. We're polluting it. Uh, mm-hmm. There are rats in your walls. But we're going to take the biggest guy on the block and make him a football player. And that makes the system all right. Um, it's well, the neoliberal the American ethic. Dream, right? That's the idea yeah. of the myth of the American dream was where one, one person of them. sort of like <laughs> out of it. Yeah, exactly. And, and well, that's true. Uh, but like sort of the idea that anything is possible for any one person, which may or may not be technically true, but whether or not it's actually a, a something that can be relied upon as a way, like, uh, like <coughs> as a way to sort of 
um, put your chips in and, and justify that the world is fair or whatever right. is, is, is completely ridiculous. It's, it's also classic literary conflict mm-hmm. with, with perception or illusion versus reality, right? Yeah, exactly. You have the perception that the dream works. You are, it's really an illusion. But That's the reality is it doesn't work for the vast, yeah. ma- the vast majority of people. It never has worked. Yeah, it doesn't Everybody's... matter if, if it's actually literally true. It matters if people believe it, right? Yeah. But exactly. There's also this other kind of corporate dream that we had at one point where all people's should, lives should be getting better, not just one pig taken out of, but every pig should be freed, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that's the Bernie message, right? The, and then the left in general is that this dream should work for everybody, not just a lucky few. Not mm-hmm. just babe the pig. You shouldn't have to be that lucky to have a decent life and not get made into bacon. Right. Definitely. We should have less people being made into bacon. <laughs> That's right. So, um, you know, there's a Buddhist saying before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Mm-hmm. So I guess we're back, you know, we were hoping for something better. We were hoping for Bernie 2020. The best we can hope for is Biden, you know, Uncle No, Nancy, and Chuck leading us. Are these peop- the people who are going to get us to the promise? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think you know the answer to that question. <laughs> Essentially, like I was saying earlier, uh, the, the presidential election, as far as I'm concerned, is pretty much over. Um, I, I, I'm still running for delegate, um, just oh, to, to, um, for a couple of reasons. I've actually had some conversations with some folks about, um, like what would be the virtue towards that. Um, and we, we kind of established that even as pointless, I suppose, as the platform is and has been, uh, last time they just completely ignored it. The party democratic party platform, right. there is, uh, a, a way to sort of heighten contradictions in that. And that's not everything it's not even like particularly significant i suppose but it's something and there are other ways to get reforms into you know these structures as you know soulless and dark as they seem and as impenetrable as they seem um but i i think that uh in general there sort of needs to be uh, an engagement with uh the sort of democratic <laughs> as it exists uh critically of course um, but all, at the same time, um, there needs to be sort of a, a, a deeper movement, uh, right. which you know can be a part of sort of a, a, almost like a patchwork of, of organizations that include things like DSA and labor unions, et cetera. That right. would be uh, the sort of actual where people are, are the ground that people are standing on, and the and the the I guess that would be the main consti- like not constituency, but the um, they would be carrying out those objectives primarily. Uh, people who are sort of aligned inside and outside of the Democratic Party official structures. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I like the DSA because it sometimes joins with the Democratic Party, but it's independent. Why don't you tell our folks a little bit about it, how they can join it? Um, sure. it's, uh, you know, I may be the lonely person up here, but I can make some company. <laughs> Democratic Socialist America is a working class organization, national organization that uh, has been around since the 80s. Uh, it really kind of blew up after the uh, 20, uh, 2016 election. 2017 is actually when I joined. Uh, and it is a, it's basically a, like a large tent type organization that makes decisions democratically. Uh, and you can uh, learn more, get more information at dsausa.org uh, forward slash uh, join. You can uh, become a member. It's uh, there are a sliding scale based on you know what what people can can pay. There's, there's cut rates for students and, and things like that. Um, but the way I pay is about five dollars a month, which is a which is affordable for me. Um, right. And if you can do you know do that, do monthly dues um, because local anyway local organizations get um, more money from that. Um, and we basically have you know a national organization. Um, that 
us, you know, carries out national politics. Uh, and we have a commission, a labor commission. Uh, we have electoral working groups. We now have uh, internationalism working groups, uh, things like that. And, and there was a pretty large Bernie Sanders campaign that was launched uh, within the organization as well. Um, now, I will say that the, the way that um, sort of things go, uh, and if you want any more information, you can actually, they have been doing um, some question and answer type things. If you check out dsausa.org, you can get information on, on Democratic Socialist America. In New Orleans, if you're here, especially if it's a Louisiana podcast, uh, right. we have local chapters in Baton Rouge. Uh, we have one in Southwest uh, Louisiana that's sort of a kind of, um, you know, Lake Charles to Lafayette, essentially, and kind of in that, that general area. Um, and then we have, uh, I think we have a, a youth DSA in uh, UNO right now, and also uh, LSU. Cool. And, what, what uh, about what about Stryport? Is there a chapter in Stryport? So that's, Stryport um, I, I believe it's that might be a part of the Southwest Louisiana um, milieu, even though it's in the Northwest. I think it's sort of doing like a large, broad net type situation, um, but unfortunately, Fortunately, I don't have uh, I don't have contacts in Shreveport, but if if you do know anyone, I can definitely kind of get you in touch with some of, with some of our people who yeah are. they they ought to be their own chapter. Shreveport's more than twice as large as Lafayette, so they should have a chapter. We uh, could use we a North Louisiana I twenty corridor uh, mm -hmm. chapter because um, you know everything from Shreveport to Monroe and. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's not that big an area. Are y'all having are, are there any Zoom meetups going on? Um, um, so the New Orleans chapter has been doing calls on Wednesdays. I believe we have one this Wednesday at 6.30. Oh, cool. um, message me and I can get you, um, I can yeah. get you a, a registration list for that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, to kind of bring this back to the electoral situation, uh, there was a lot of sort of action on Twitter this past weekend in terms of the, the sort of Bernie sh shaming movement that we were mentioning, right. uh, where the national organization, there's a national communications sort of team or person, and they posted from the page, uh, we are not endorsing Joe Biden as an organization. Now, That's a lot of them. part of the reason for that is because at our last um, convention, uh, which we we do biannual conventions. Um, we did this took place in Atlanta in 2019. Uh, there was a resolution that we passed as an organization. This is not just a, you know, a board like the Working Families Party or whatever making a decision. The, the decision that was passed by this re resolution in 2019 was that the only person. <coughs> that the DSA would endorse for this election would be Bernie Sanders. And it was contentious internally as to whether or not we would even uh, endorse Bernie Sanders. Now it ended up right. being uh, somewhat, you know, overwhelming, uh, overwhelming uh, polling we had in favor, but, but there were people that were very strongly against it. And if you would think that, that as a large organization that was already skeptical of, of endorsing Bernie Sanders would, after they've passed a resolution to only endorse Bernie Sanders would then go around and without even having a convention uh, endorse Joe Biden, then that's, then I guess you don't understand what democracy, how democracy works. Right. Right. Um, Cause the, like we have a national political committee in, in DSA at 16 members. They can't make a decision that would overrule the convention. That's the highest authority within the organization. <coughs> well, and, they take democracy seriously, unlike yeah. the Democrats and the Republicans. That's what mm -hmm. it comes down to. Well, right. the, uh, the Democrats basically, it's not that we turned our back on them. They kicked us out, right? Mm -hmm. It's like we see this surge of positive, progressive energy, and we've got to do everything we can to stop it. Mm -hmm. and it's like Joe Biden thinks it's cheating to offer people, offer people anything to help them materially. You know, this is a guy who spent his life as, you know, a neoliberal warrior. He, he mm -hmm. cut my social security. I can't retire until <clears throat> I'm 67. He used to be 65. And he was all in on that. So the idea that he might cut social security, oh, yeah, he will, because he's done it. Um, well, he's. I've, I've heard them compared to hogs at a trough. So he is a neoliberal hog at the trough, right? And he's been the, feeding at the public trough, 
pr pretty much like most of them for years. The Biden you try family to yank has that hog done... away from that trough, and that hog will bite you. Yes, the, the, the Biden family has done quite well uh, from Biden's career. The rest of us, not so much. And it's not like he's changing. You know, Hillary <clears throat> at least would get out and say, I'm going to be in front and I'm going to adopt your, um, I'm going to adopt your, your platform. And of course, after the convention, we never heard of it again. It was just vote for me because I'm not Trump. And is that Biden's campaign? I'm just not quite as big, I'm not quite as rapey as Trump. I'm not quite as, um, you know, corrupt as Trump. Um, oh, by the way, I may be worse on uh, trade deals than Trump. <laughs> it, it really is a problematic choice uh, when you start looking at him and not just, I don't like Trump. Yeah, and uh, again, if you're making, if you're part of the Biden campaign and you're running on you know, character or whatever, like I'm such a good guy. Um, and then you're all stuck <clears throat> in Donald Trump because I don't, you know, because I'm a better, you know, person than him. And, and that's the person making the case. I mean, they're just recently, you know, sexual assault. I mean, they weren't recently. Yeah, ask, uh, ask Tara Reid what a good guy yeah, he there's, is. There's, a, you know, sexual assault allegations that are put up on, on uh, Joe Biden. And, you know, again, this is not even making a, a, a judgment on Biden himself, though, though, I mean, I do have opinions. I'm just for the sake, let's put that aside for the sake of this. If you're making an argument of character uh, and you're making the case that you should be the president because you, you know, you are a better person than Donald Trump because he does not respect women or and all these other sorts of things. And then you have the same things that are that apply to you. Where do right. you? Where did your argument go? Where did your case go to be president? I mean, how, how did this happen? And, and how will that look in a general election? And, you know, Trump is corrupt. Biden is corrupt. Trump is, an, you know, abusive toward women. So is uh, Biden. Uh, Trump terrible when it comes <clears throat> to race. But Biden yeah. passed the crime bill that put a lot mm -hmm. of black people in jail for the last 30 years. Um, and Trump lies all the time. Well, guess what? Do you remember when Joe Biden was arrested with Nelson Mandela for a <clears throat> civil rights dis, you know, only, only Joe Biden, only Joe Biden remembers that. Only Joe Biden <clears throat> remembers it, but he remembers it quite fondly getting arrested. That's, with. that's Joe Biden from the parallel earth once again. Yeah. And earth. Bernie Sanders actually did get arrested for, mm -hmm. you know, civil rights protests. So, yeah. Although <laughs> Not with Nelson Mandela. <laughs> no, but yeah, there's, 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 uh, there are still photographs. And there may even be footage, film footage, but there's definitely still photographs of Bernie being arrested in Chicago as a young mm -hmm. man when he was mm -hmm. at University of Chicago. So there's also the attitude of the elites that you get with Biden that, that goes along with Trump. He's just, he is, again, the sort of the polite face of the elites and the polite face of the establishment. Yeah, well, that's the only thing he has going for him, really, is the fact that he's sort of like an affable dude or whatever, I suppose. Uh, that's sort of his reputation, right? Um, that's sort of the appeal that he allegedly has. I just don't, I mean, and again, this is me not necessarily, like, again, I haven't, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to, like, make a case against Biden anymore. I mean, the, the primary, as far as I'm concerned, is over, and the, the election, for, to, a, you know, to a similar extent, is largely over. Um, I'm just sort of, like, pointing out the vulnerabilities that exist right now, right? right. And, 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 and I don't think that these um, qualities, you know, that Joe Biden has, the ones that, that people talk about, um, differentiate himself from Trump in any meaningful way. Uh, at least they can be, they can be very, let me, let me just put it like this. They Go can ahead. be very easily flattened into like things that could be washed away between the other two. They can be called even, even if they're not, right? <laughs> I mean, it, he's, he may be, again, not as bad. He may not lie as much as Trump, but mm -hmm. he has lied and we've known, you know, we've watched him lie on, you know, the TV and be fact checked, you know, and, all these other things, uh, you know, he's got a lot of sleaze accompanying him. So well, and, and watch watch his watch his most rabid supporters, and even the, the somewhat tepid supporters, but the rabid ones will come out just as soon as we post this, and they will be attacking us or people like us. Anybody who offers a critique, they will be attacked. 
So you know, they're going to be attacked. You can predict that right now. I'm not yeah, in here, he, I can take it. Yeah, right. Yeah, they, have, they don't like me anyway. Um, so yeah, it, it's um, it's a conundrum. How do we go? Because Bernie was going to run an issues campaign. You know, mm -hmm. here's Trump on the issues. Here are my issues. You know, here we see the biggest economic downturn since the depression, more people being thrown out of work than ever in our history in a single go, um, in a short period of time. Uh, what do you do about that? Um, we see, um, you know, a lot of people, you know, Joe Biden's running around saying the healthcare people want is the healthcare they get from their business, you know, work. <coughs> well, guess what? We've had, let's see, three plus six, what, 20 million people out of work <coughs> in the last couple of weeks? Um, so yeah, um, they aren't getting their health care from their employer anymore. Well, what's the answer to that? Well, it's Bernie Care and Biden's answer is lower the uh, Medicare age to 60, which is, you know, it's something, but it's not much. Um, and he's promising not to solve our problems, <laughs> you know, so, <coughs> so it then devolves into who's a better person to take care of this, who's more uh you know who has the better character who is more um competent well neither one of them has much of a character neither one of them is competent so you know it just you go back to your tribe at that point right and 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 again let's look forward i suppose in terms of like what are some things that can be looked at as a positives from the right. Bernie Sanders campaign and that's sort of like where I like to to kind of orient myself because if I sort of like dwell on these kinds <laughs> of things, it's I, too depressing I get, I get bored very quickly and I also like get I do sort of like feel like I'm doing I'm like I'm not doing anything I, right. I, I feel like I and, and not, not to say that, that this isn't part of a process that needs to happen it's very important but sort of I have to I have to put my mind on the next thing or I'll be here forever does that make sense oh um, yeah yeah well that's partly why I wanted to talk to you is yeah. what next, what's next on our agenda is actual leftists as opposed to you know well we need to figure out what we've learned from this um campaign already so basically we learned two three things i think that are the most important one is that bernie's the, pol the policy platform that bernie sanders ran on was very popular right yeah union uh, uh union um workers rights essentially uh, Medicare for all, uh, free college, debt, you know, loan forgiveness, et cetera, on down the line. Those things right. are extremely popular, one. Two, people didn't vote for them, not because they didn't like those policies, but they thought that Bernie perhaps didn't have a chance because there was I, this narrative, I suppose, which was quite untrue, uh, if you ask me, that this narrative that that joe biden was the electable one where right, right? So right. he got the support especially after the sort of great consolidation that right. happened right before super tuesday amongst all these sort of centrist candidates except for elizabeth warren and she stayed in for for a different reason uh not even making a judgment there whatever it's not that, that's <laughs> important I've got a few. <laughs> there was an there was an impact but not a judge uh, like there, there was an impact for sure um but but that's two, right? One was essentially policies are popular. Two, that electability mattered more than that. And then three was the fact that that narrative was able to be crafted by mainline press. Right. And there is, there is <clears throat> I mean, if you look at it, Sanders got zero got representation in the press that was right. that was positive. It was all just like, well, you need to do Biden. Or what about this Buddha judge? What about this Klobuchar early on? And then it sort of consolidated around just like the, the candidates did, right? Um, so what well, didn't bloom board for a couple of weeks, you know, that was you know, even the president and, and actually we wrote like like me and a bunch of teachers were in the process of organizing against uh, something when when Randy Weingarten, the president of the American Federation of Teachers, was talking and, and was talking about like, wow, Bloomberg has a chance when that's the question about Bernie. And it's sort of like there's no like 
Bloomberg is one of the great villains of yeah. uh, education. And why is the, you know, uh, and I don't want to get into this too much, but why is the president of the you know, uh, union doing that on national television? Why are they, they, they kind of unabated, like not, not necessarily throwing support, but sort of like bringing up the chances and talking in a sort of like obliquely positive light about this person who's like <coughs> an enemy. Um, so anyway, Bloomberg wrote some powerful check, Jeffrey. Uh, that's I, yeah, I understand that. <laughs> I understand that. Um, so I guess th those are, that, that's the big question in terms of like actionable things is how do we turn what we've learned, the electability thing, the media thing, and the policies thing into something going forward, right? Now, people here on this call <coughs> and who are probably listening are participants, I suppose, in media, uh, or at least like have attention to a certain extent to media, right? Right. Um, we need to find ways to make the, the media that is not part of the mainstream a part of that mainstream, inject it into the mainstream some kind of way. Right. Because you are down there in New Orleans, we're up here mm -hmm. with our little thing, but I don't think <clears throat> it's not like we're one of the main, you know, cable news networks, which get a lot right. of people watch those and, and you have your we're back to watching the empty podium at the white house waiting for trump to show up right <clears throat> they could have given bernie five minutes a night you know mm -hmm. um and, he wasn't not that he wasn't doing it he was doing uh, online yeah. video things for the entire coronavirus thing he had on his on well, his uh his video uh on his youtube channel he would always be putting right. speech, he would do three and four a day yeah. where he would have like live appearances that that anybody like cnn would have absolutely cut to for trump in 2016 totally that, that what you're saying points up the necessity mm -hmm. and this is a weakness for all of us on the left but it points up the necessity for independent uh you know not e either non-profit media or definitely independent left media mm -hmm. right whether whether it's i mean i'm reading because Bruce and I follow a lot of lefty podcasts and I read a lot of lefty articles in online publications. And we're seeing right now the, the really uh, important publication truth dig is going through some real hard times that may result in the, the, the mm -hmm. online site going down. I mean, biting the yeah. dust. Yeah. That's that, that has uh, been around for a very long time. Isn't that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's, it, it publishes the work of some major lefty thinkers mm -hmm. like Chris Hedges, like Naomi Klein, like mm -hmm. uh, Robert Shear, who's in, in, in back of a lot of the trouble apparently. And I, I'm not following this that closely yet. Cause I haven't listened to the podcast that goes through what the problems are, mm -hmm. but except to say that again, we need independent left media like us, like the majority report, like counterpunch, which has a, a podcast and an online site. I mean, all of these, we need every one of them. Uh, and, and like mushrooms in a field, they need to be proliferating and not, you know, dying out, frankly. And, not and I think that would get out more of the word. And not just proliferating. There needs to be a coordination amongst them. Right. So, build, so there can be sort of a building of a, uh, uh, I, 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 you know, I get very um, careful with my language on these sorts of things. Because I am sort of generally um, skeptical of, in, at least in terms of efficacy, um, I'm skeptical of the sort of positioning of outsideriness. Does that make sense? Right. Because yeah. there's sort of a, a rhetorical, I have to prove my right to be here. And when you're doing that, uh, as opposed to with mainstream media, when, when they, can just do, they can just do their propaganda there is it's a lot more easy to it's a lot easier for them to get their messaging out do you see what i'm saying and, well, and so I think it's sort of a um finding a way to bring the mass culture towards the kind of media that we're talking about as opposed to creating an alternative to the culture or a subculture i think it's going to take time to do that i mean just like it did in the days you know before the new deal uh, mm -hmm. where you had in those days, and those were print yeah, outlets, but like the daily, you know, like the, what was it called? The Daily Worker or the Worker or something. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, there were various, and then of course you had the crisis even earlier than that where the NAACP or one of the African-American organizations that was publishing that, you know, uh, that I guess it was a magazine or, or, or newspaper. So I think it's going to take time to do this. This is not oh, yeah. just something that'll take even say five or six years. It's probably gonna take a few decades to mm -hmm. try to rebuild the left mm -hmm. uh, because it well, was lying out on the slab. 
we don't have funding. You know, the right wing <laughs> billionaires will open up their wallet. They believe in wing nut welfare. And, you know, somebody like uh, Ianopoulos, let's give that, I like the cut of his job. Let's give him $10 million and see what he can do with it. It's just right. kind of blue sky stuff. And, you know, if we had, if, if Soros were doing what the right wing thinks Soros is doing, because that's what their billionaires do, we'd all be doing really well right now. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, there's a North Louisiana, you know, progressive podcast. Uh, let's give them a couple of million. And, say, and there's this guy down in New Orleans, uh, Good Morning Comrade. Oh, yeah. Let, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's fund that. And we don't have that. We have to self fund, you know, either through uh, getting donations or just, you know, Stephen and I just don't volunteer. We don't make any money off of this. Right. You spend money on equipment and hosting even. Uh, yeah, right. One of those sorts of situations. And, and again, in a capitalist society where that is the entire framework by which, you know, resources are allocated, then, I mean, that does make a certain logical sense, right? That that's the way that it is. But how can we find ways as, as like our... Um, our, our, our strength is in our numbers and the amount right. of, and the, mm -hmm. sort of, of organizing and what needs to happen if we're going to have any, the only way we have a chance to fight it is if we're in it together. So like the idea of independent media is good if the independent media is not independent from like one another. <laughs> Interdependent <laughs> media almost. Right. Uh, uh, it, but isn't that the purpose of, of net roots though i mean they bring together lefty types of you know media and i guess individuals too uh to come together to those conventions every year perhaps it was uh at one <laughs> point um i i mean i've been to net roots nation when it came to new orleans in 2017 2018 i can't remember which and and again it was really great to to meet some folks i met sarah jaffe who's a labor reporter who she actually came yeah. on the show uh not long after that she was she's very cool um i met a really i met a lot of folks um from across the the the, the you know sort of like online you know lefty liberal media sphere if that's what you want to call it um there was also a very like interesting component of I also met some, uh, by the way, some some teachers from West Virginia, which is shortly after the West Virginia strike. Um, right. It was also a very like interesting component, as you would find at, I guess, any expo of that kind of just like, there were so many apps for sale that uh, in the sort of lobby for that place that I couldn't even keep track. You know, there was so much like merch and, and it was so commercialized. And, 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 and I guess I suppose that again, in, in the society that we live in, when something gets to the point where they can even get to the convention center, you know, they can afford the convention center that that's what it's right. Going to be. But I guess you have to be aware <coughs> this is the, that is what we're dealing with here. And it's not that, it's not that it's something worth dismissing. It's absolutely not. There's a lot of opportunity in terms of networking and building connections and stuff like that there. But we have to also understand that Marcos Melitis and all the people at the top are going to be rotten. Right. I mean, it, it gets, it's more, we've got to point down more than we do up and get the grassroots mm -hmm. going. And you are a union person yourself. Talk to us about unions in Louisiana and what we can do to kind of claw our way back a bit because unions are particularly weak in the south and louisiana is certainly no exception to that it, it certainly hasn't always been the case that uh unions are weak in the south or louisiana it's just that there's a more recent history of right. things like that um now if you do look at labor and this is cribbing from a friend but like labor law in louisiana is sort of relatively friendly to some other places within the South, but in labor organizing is a bit, I suppose, it's somewhat remarkable uh, in, in Louisiana. But yeah, the, there, is, uh, there are a lot of impediments and there are a lot of challenges going forward. I think that we do need to do a couple of things. One, we need to find you know, members and also leaders, anybody that's involved in, in uh, like already existing unions, I suppose, in Louisiana, and get them at least talking to one another, uh, engaging with one another. And, and I mean, 
I'm always sort of like everybody complains about oh there's so many podcasts on the internet right now but if if we have a couple of people like five folks from you know <laughs> different or even the same union in Louisiana talking about their experiences on a podcast or something or writing a newsletter or just sort of having a space by which they can be communicating I think that's a potential way to sort of start building because you can right. have that be a center for where contact begin. Um, there that's was, where you, that's where you need people that will host something like a lunch or a dinner. Yeah. Or like you said, some kind of a really, that's, that's the best place to meet people is at some mm -hmm. kind of a meal. You yeah, have a meal cool. of some sort and then you have some speakers coming in and then mm -hmm. you have, and you know, if you want to get really technocratic about it, you have so-called breakout sessions Yeah, and then you let those people and, and you don't just bring the leaders in, you bring in, the common people yeah, because you can get to be down. so much. Yeah. You can, you can get to be so much of a leader that you forget the so-called followers. And I, I hate that terminology anyway, sure, I know but you, you but, but you bring in these people then. And, and you have probably heard this Jeffrey, that what you do, and I, I, I'm involved with the state poor people's campaign and I'm on the mm -hmm. board oh, cool. and <clears throat> what you, what you do there is, and, and this has been suggested to us, let's say that you are a teacher, then you show up at a black lives matter uh, meeting or, mm -hmm. or an event. Or you're in Black Lives Matter and you show up at something for, what is it, SEIU, but you show up at that. And then the SEIU people show up at something like Standing Rock it's or Biden Bridge. It's just developing these, this, this, um, those relationships. Yeah, it's just exactly. plain old developing relationships with people. Mm -hmm. And then you start developing friendships with people and you start developing allies. You see, mm -hmm. well, and it's a, it becomes a web, a web of connections. Mm -hmm. Up here, the, Black Democrats and the white Democrats are pretty friendly toward each other, but they're still meeting separately. We can't even get all the Democrats in a room, mm -hmm. um, you know, because we've, we've had rallies where you get a couple of white people coming to uh, mostly, in, and a couple of black people show up at the mostly white thing. And so, yeah, we've got to start reaching across these social barriers that have really been imposed by the powers that be to keep us separated. And while we're on the issue of labor, I wanted to give a shout out to Charles Leather Breeches Smith, who took part in the Gravo uh, riot, which was a, a timber uh, organizing uh, work, the workers out in southwest Louisiana, and they brought in a bunch of anti-union thugs to, who started a gunfight, and he shot it out with them. He was a gunfighter himself, which they used to have. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they were unable to get him, but then later on, four deputies gunned him down. So, um, wow. you know, it's the corporate powers working with the political powers. So what, is this like in the 19-teens or sometime? Yeah, it was about 100 years ago. Let me get my date back. 1912, yeah. So, so this um, is... Uh, 108. They were trying to get... Granddad was a, was a temporary... Hello? Okay. You're, kind of, um, you're coming in and out, Stephen. Can you hear us? I think you'll be back. Yeah, can you hear me? Ah, there you go. Try, try again. You were talking about your granddad? Yeah, but my, my, my grand, yeah, he was a logger. Uh, you know, back, uh, God, probably starting around 1912, 1914, all the way up to about 1950, he was a logger. And that was in the early days of that. That's when the Louisiana timber industry made a lot of people rich. But of course, with the middle class and poor people, they didn't really go anywhere. And there was a move at that time. He was working out of Lakin Parish and Union Parish up here in the hills. But there was a move across the state to try to get these loggers organized. Mm -hmm. And that inevitably then produced that violence that you're talking about in West Louisiana and Southwest Louisiana. So anyway, we're a little less likely as union people to get shot right now. Um, so that's, you know, <laughs> that's on the, on the flip side, we're on the, we're, we're much less likely to shoot people as well. Right. I know. And maybe that's the problem. Uh, <laughs> that that episode like, should have been memorialized in a Woody Guthrie type song. You know? It's never too late. <laughs> right. Journal. He's got a plaque, and they put him a plaque up. And I was not calling for us to go out and shoot people. Sure, 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 sure. Some of our I guess what I, what I say is that on those kind of like sharper fronts, there has been a bit 
of a mutual disarmament, or you can look at it that way, or a capitulation right. on the labor side, <clears throat> one or the other, um, you know, for better or for worse, you know, that's what has happened. And, you know, the, the trajectory of, you know, workers and, and organized labor since, you know, since the 1970s. Well, in the 1970s, it wasn't particularly, like, like sharp in that way. Um, at least not to the extent of the, you know, the early teens. That was the decade the Democrats started shivving the labor movement, uh, you know, stabbing them in the back. And Petco, and Petco too. Right, right. African controllers. But Democrats didn't stand up for them, you know. Um, Unions were seen, you know, I mean, they talk about, oh, the union's corrupt, that guy, uh, he made $60,000 last year. How much did the chairman of the board make? Mm -hmm. You know, how many, you know, $60,000, how much of the yacht that that guy owns would that even pay for? I'm all for good governance in unions. I think that's important, but I think, the corruption is overplayed, and we've talked about that before. Um, Certainly less important than uh, good governance, uh, or less important than sort of like good governments and accountability when it comes to private industry. Yeah, yeah, let's, <laughs> right. Let's prioritize that. They're, they've run the country into the ground and broken it, you know. They, yeah, well, the establishment always gets freaked out when there's corruption involved, and yet look what the establishment does, mm-hmm. right? It's cl- classic hypocrisy. Well, there's a type of corruption. You know, uh, Michael Brooks has an argument that I've adopted for myself, which is um, you have to look under the hood when people start saying the word corruption. Like, what does it mm-hmm. mean? When they talk about well, who's it, Lula, that was in jail for basically nothing, while his opponent was burning the lungs of the planet, um, mm-hmm. and is an open. <laughs> um, right, there was the, a certain necessity, a certain like thing that you had to do specifically in Brazil that was outside of the sort of like legal bounds, I suppose. But right. without that, the, there is no politics. There is no way to get anything right. possibly done. So with the, if you rule out every legal end by which you're going, by, by which you can do anything, you're only making it so that illegal methods, you know, again, by the book or whatever. And, right. and Lula, Lula was not particularly <laughs> radical, at least not in his governance. No. Um, he was, he was a good, what we would say, New Deal Democrat in our context. You know, yeah, he yes. lifting people out of poverty, but mm-hmm. he didn't destroy capitalism. Right. Sounds, sounds a little bit like Huey Long, you know? Yeah, which may be the mistake. Maybe when you leave the capitalists in, you know, in place, because money never sleeps, and eventually people get tired. You know, mm-hmm. the, the movement runs out of steam, and the money... You know, it's just they've got stuff sitting on the shelf ready to go. And as soon as there's a corona or, you know, Katrina comes on, hell, let's close down, um, you know, uh, Charity Hospital. Well, then, you know, 15 years later, oh, my God, there are a lot of black people dying from corona in New Orleans. <laughs> well, could the two possibly be related? You know, the lack of health care in the high death rate. I mean, what's your opinion? Um, so I think that uh, this could be very easily summed up in, um, especially when it comes to the differences between how, and, and the real sort of like way that, that, you know, private industry and labor relations that changed after the New Deal uh, happened after the, first, the, the Second World War, right? And if you right. compare the United States to Europe, um, private industry in and, and this is, I'm definitely critical of Michael Fried here, uh, who said this at a public event that uh, he was kind enough to, to join us at about two years ago. Um, but he said, after the Second World War, private industry in Europe uh, was basically at its end and labor was strong, right? Yeah, because right. they were right there in the thick of it. And they needed to rebuild the entire country and they needed the workers. In the United States, the, they had the opposite problem. They had the, because private industry had just ramped up to levels that it had never, ever, ever had to do before in the past. Right. And essentially, cap, capital was strong and ready to pounce. 
And so right. that was sort of like where you see that undoing of the New Deal trajectory from a material standpoint. Right. Well, in back of that, America, Americans are always, this is kind of the meta, the meta, meta narrative. Mm -hmm. Americans don't remember their history. No. Because we don't remember our history, we get in problems. We're getting in real trouble. I mean, seriously, look at, look at us right now trying to rebuild a left movement in this country when thankfully at least some people are doing that, but they're going back and reading the history. If you read the history, you see it, not just the struggles that the people faced, you know, a hundred years ago, or even say 50 or 75 years ago, but you also understand why they did what they did and what they believed and why they believe what they believe. And when I, I tried to educate somebody about that online the other day, and he, he literally said to me, I don't need to read that. Mm -hmm. I don't need to read that stuff. No, Would you consume it in other ways? I don't think so. He was trying to say, and we need what I'm about to say because I'm quoting him. He said, I've lived some of these experiences all my life. Well, that's true, but you need to unite the experiential knowledge with the intellectual knowledge. Mm -hmm. They have to be united or a, 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 a new labor and a new left move is not going to go anywhere. We've got I to know why we believe what we believe philosophically, but then how that developed in time, that's the history. Mm -hmm. We've got to know the philosophy and the history behind this or we're dead. Mm -hmm. The people on the right, I, you know, I find their beliefs detestable and hypocritical. However, they know what, what they believe and they know why they believe it. And again, I well, think their beliefs are ludicrous. And um, to add on to that, and this, um, unfortunately, is going to have, have to be my last sort of comment, but, but not only do they have the, the right wing, do they have sort of the um, like willingness to engage in history uh, in the way that you just said, which was, which was well said, they also have a certain kind of ownership over it by which I mean uh, they have the ability or they or perhaps audacity to claim the tradition that they're saying that they've they've had you know or the say or, or sort of like the they have the most legitimate claim to the history that we the world that we're all living in now I think that you and I and Bruce would all agree that that's something that's, you know, written from basically in the rear view mirror, right? Mm -hmm. Hi history is sort of like written after the fact and everything and, and the narrative is sort of like picked out and, and constructed on the back end. So understanding that, what is our claim to history? What is the left's claim to history? And how can we engage with that? Now, um, I, I, I'm going to make one comparison that Bernie Sanders made sometimes. Hmm. But then he, the rest of the time, he didn't. And when it was important, I would argue that he didn't. Um, when it came to things like FDR, he would, in a speech that you know, nobody was watching that was on the internet, talk about claiming the tradition of FDR, which is Awesome. Right. That's one of the best right. things you could possibly do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but then when, I, when a debate happens, and I'm definitely uh, uh, our, our friend Harvey K, uh, I, I, I kind of had this conversation with him, uh, which we should get him on to talk about Huey Long again. I but, but, definitely want to talk to him well, about Huey I want to talk about Earl Long because I'm related to that family. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, um, well, I'll right. reach out to him. Uh, he and I are on very good terms at this point. But anyway, yeah. um, he, basically, he, 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 uh, his point is that, and he talked about this in the election, um, when it came to a big, high-profile situation, Bernie did back off of FDR. He right. backed away right. when it mattered. And what the right wing has historically done, the way that they have this sort of claim, um, and, and this is exactly what Harvey told me recently, um, and he wrote about this in this book, uh, Take Hold of Our History, uh, Make America Radical Again, which is, uh, which is something you should definitely pick up if you have a chance. Uh, essentially, Ronald Reagan in the 1980s claimed Thomas Paine, essentially, if not the, the legacy itself, the words. He said, essentially, right. we have the, the power to start the world over anew. And mm -hmm. basically claiming who was a fundamentally, like, Democrat, a revolutionary. Alex he Harris. was an American yeah. revolutionary. Yeah, and and sort of like using <clears throat> that language and claiming that language in a very strong rhetorical and ownership sense, yeah. and turning it, taking it away, which is mm -hmm. basically simply it's simply chess. I mean, you just take your queen away, you sacrifice a bishop, boom, you're good. Right. Well, and 
We can't um, leave our we can't leave our pieces hanging like this. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. We you know, you know what are the Democrats going to say to Louisiana, good old boy and woman um, voters? That's going to bring them back to the party. It would have to be the Bernie FDR. New mm -hmm. Deal kind of stuff. We're going to give you a job. We're going to educate your kids. You're going to have health care. We're going to make sure your water is healthy. We're going to clean up your environment. Uh, we're going to rebuild the roads. We're going to be bridges. We're, we're also going to give you a look at what FDR did. This is something I admire because my Bruce knows this. Jeffrey, you don't know it, but my folks grew up during the New Deal. They were teenagers. Mm -hmm. There was a sense of pride in the country. And I'm, I'm watching the FDR, uh, oh, the, the Roosevelt's film right now on Ken Burns, and you have to take it for what it is because it's establishment history, but there is a sense of pride of those people at that time. And my parents had that. My mom's got it. She's nearly a hundred years old. That mm -hmm. there was pride saying we not only can do this, we will do this. You mm -hmm. see what I'm getting at? And there's a sense of community. There's a sense of, of everybody's in this together. And, and, and the right wing has this knack for atomizing mm -hmm. everybody. And that's really part of neoliberalism, too. They're able to atomize because they have, you, you, you mentioned, like, mainstream history. They, they have a, a, a sort of authority and legitimacy, at least, like I was saying, like, it's not rooted in anything material. It's rooted in the sort of idea and framing. Right, right. right. The way the narrative is constructed, they can say, this is the story. Right. And if if you know you are disagreeing with that, you have to do that in response. And 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 so essentially, they would always have the initiative when telling these kinds of things. And so we need our own story. So, oh, we need to we need to find a way to reclaim that initiative in, in an affirmative way that's not reacting. I think it's good to have a spectrum of stuff out there. Yeah. Like the reason FDR was able to do what he did was he could tell him, "Look, I've got this Huey Long guy." Mm -hmm. and the reason Huey Long could do what he did was say, you know, there's that guy over there, Lenin and Stalin. I mean, he got up in the Senate and said this. Men, it will not be long until there will be a mob assembling here to hang senators from the rafters of the Senate. Mm -hmm. and I have to determine whether I will stay and be hung with you or go out and lead the mob. <laughs> <laughs> Here's you know, they were scared. <laughs> this will have to be the last thing for me because I actually have to go at an appointment. Okay. But... Uh, Think about this as a pitch that you can have this one for free. Think about like the, 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 the ancient Greek and Roman lives that Plutarch wrote about and just right. think about it as the parallel lives of, uh, of Vladimir Lenin and Huey P. Long. Oh, that would be a good episode. Yeah. We could trace how they rose to power. <laughs> Well, or Earl. I mean, I I rewatched re the Earl Long documentary last night from LPB, and people criticized him. Even his own brother did, but people criticized mm -hmm. him. He was the more radical of the two brothers in terms of his. I'm not. I'm not talking about his ideology, but his approach was much more radical. Mm -hmm. He didn't have, as everybody said, the finesse. He had none of that finesse. He was get, get down in the dirt, dirty fighter, mm -hmm. but he fought for working people. And he mm -hmm. had that stump speech, and I, I will play this at some point with you and bring you back on the air. But he cool. came on, uh, came on in the stump, saying, "I'm the best friend that the poor man and the poor and we would say African American, but he said the poor colored man ever had." Yeah. And he was at that time. He was. He was the only radical in the South. Uh -huh. You know, they they claimed George Wallace, but George Wallace was an out. He was a racist. right wing. Yeah, he was a yeah, yeah. yeah. Right and and, and Earl Earl believed. I mean, we had a guy talking with us just the other day. Earl believed in treating African-Americans as people, as human beings. Mm -hmm. Now he used God. coarse language, but he, you know, he, he was adding African-American Louisianans to the voter rolls, mm -hmm. adding them, adding them, not taking them off like they were doing in Texas and Arkansas and Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Jeffrey. This has been great. And I feel a little better and we, we need to get organized. So Absolutely. yeah, I do want to start coming to your online meeting some because I would like totally. International Workers of the World Unite. That's yeah, right. <laughs> Even if right, we don't guys. have jobs right now. Thank you so much. And uh, if you don't mind, I can, uh, could I just uh, plug GMC? Of course. Make any plugs yeah. you want to. Yeah, you can. Uh, so you can check out my radio show, Good Morning Comrade, on WHIV FM. Uh, we come on uh, Tuesdays at 8 a.m. Uh, you can also check us out online, goodmorningcomrade.com. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter at Eminent Prof, E M I N E N T P R O F. 
and you're available through all the ordinary yeah. pod catchers like mm-hmm. iTunes. Yeah. And, and we've been doing we've been doing a lot of episodes recently. Uh, and actually, stay tuned. A couple of friends of mine uh, and I might be starting a new uh, labor or specifically labor oriented podcast. Oh, good. Uh, that should be c- coming up really soon. I don't want to say too much right now, uh, but definitely check out our most recent interviews. Uh, I had one with Diana Hussein, who is a st- uh, staffer at uh, National Service Workers Union uh, and Hospitality Workers Union, and also Connor Lewis, who is an uh, organizer in Pennsylvania for uh, educators. And our uh, friend Jenny has been out a lot in her respirator, uh, you know, in, out in the street trying to organize yeah. online. So. Yeah, she's uh, live streaming. She does, Jenny Yanez doesn't stop. She's always on her on her, on her business. Uh, she's got so you, much. You'll be the best friend of Lobby before this is over with. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I had me. to get in that swipe. <laughs> Hater, haters come at me. Make me famous. Right. <laughs> well, you take care, Jeffrey. Y'all too. Don't yeah, get take sick. care. Uh-huh.